Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we'll explain the facelift or retardectomy approach. The retardectomy or facelift approach to the mandibular ramus is a variant of the retromandibular approach. The only difference is that the cutaneous incision is placed in a more hidden location in a facelift approach. The procedure for the deeper dissection is the same as they described for the retromandibular approach. The main advantage of the retardectomy approach to the ramus is the less conspicuous facial scar. The disadvantage is the additional time required for the closure. The facelift approach provides the same exposure as the retromandibular and preauricular excesses combined. The only difference is that the skin incision is placed in a more cosmetically acceptable location. It exposes the entire ramus from behind the posterior border. Therefore, it may be useful for procedures involving the area on or near the condylar neck, head, or the ramus itself. When using the facelift approach, the distance from the skin incision to the intervention area is reduced, allowing for a more direct approach to the ramus and condyle compared to that of the submandibular approach. The anatomic structures, uh, to take into account are the trunk and branches of the facial nerve, the retromandibular vein, the great auricular nerve, and the superficial temporal artery and vein. The exposure offered by the facelift incision uh, is indicated in green. The relevant landmarks on the face useful during the dissection should be exposed throughout the surgical procedure. Uh, when using the retardectomy approach uh, to the mandibular ramus angle area, the structures that should be visible in the surgical field uh, include the corner of the eye, the corner of the mouth, and the lower lip interiorly, and the entire ear and descending hairline, uh, and two to three centimeter of hair superior to the posterior hairline posterior. A standard facelift incision is made through the skin and subcutaneous tissues. The incision may vary depending on local anatomy and hair distribution pattern. Part of the pre-auricular incisions may be hidden behind the tragus that is end oral incision. The skin is marked before injecting a vasoconstrictor. And let's explain these points uh, with the help of a clinical picture. The incision begins approximately 1.5 to 2 centimeter superior to the uh, zygomatic arch, just posterior to the uh, interior extent of the hairline. Now, uh, incision can be extended forward onto the hairline for better uh, retraction. The incision then curves posteriorly and inferiorly, blending into the pre auricular incision in the natural crease. Uh, interior to the pinna, the same position is in the pre-auricular approach to the temporomandibular giant. The incision extends to the posterior aspect of the ear before sweeping down the hairline. Uh, now explain the, uh, this uh, posterior extension of the incision. The incision continues under the ear lobe and approximately three millimeter onto the posterior surface of the auricle instead of continuing in the mastoid ear skin crease here. So this modification prevents a noticeable scar that occurs during the uh, contractive healing of the flap, pulling the scar into the neck. It means if the incision is in the crease here, the scar would have moved down the neck and become visible here. Uh, but due to this modification, the scar uh, ends in the crease between the auricle and the mastoid skin because the in initial incision is uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, the posterior uh, surface of the auricle instead of in, the, uh, in this crease. So uh, when it will uh, contract during the healing, uh, the scar will become uh, in the area of the uh, this uh, uh, crease. So it will not be visible in the 
neck so uh due to this modification the scars in, ends in the crease between the auricle and the mastoid skin uh, at a point where the incision is well hidden by the uh, ear it curves posteriorly uh, towards the hairline here you can see and then runs along the hairline or just inside it for a few centimeter a vasoconstrictor is injected subcutaneously to aid in hemostasis at the time of incision local anesthetics should not be injected deep to the platysma muscle because of the risk of the making the facial nerve branches non conductive that make electrical testing impossible the incision the initial incision sorry uh, is made through the skin and subcutaneous tissue only uh, illustration demonstrating incision through skin and subcutaneous tissue uh, uh, hey, this is the photograph of a patient showing the incision and dissection into the uh, subcutaneous layer uh, the skin flap is elevated in the subcutaneous plane taking care not to injure the great auricular nerve lying below the subcutaneous tissue overlying the sternocleidomastoid muscle the flap must be widely uh, undermined interiorly and inferiorly let's explain it this illustration and photograph are showing uh, uh, undermining of the skin uh, with a medzim bomb or facelift incisors a uh, skin flap is elevated through this incision using sharp and blunt dissection with medzim bomb or retedectomy scissors uh, the flap should be widely undermined uh, to create a subcutaneous pocket that extends uh, below the angle of the mandible and a few centimeter interior to the posterior border of the mandible there are no anatomic structures of any significance in this plane except for the great auricular nerve which is deep to the subcutaneous dissection is pointed in the previous slide hemostasis is then achieved with electrocoagulation of the bleeding subdermal vessels the flap is undermined above the superficial musculo epineurotic system level to identify the posterior border of the platysma and the nearby great auricular nerve illustration and photograph showing the extent of the subcutaneous dissection necessary for exposing the posterior mandible the skin should be completely freed uh, so that it can be retracted below the angle of the mandible and to the pre mesenteric notch once the skin has been retracted interiorly and inferiorly the soft tissue overlying the posterior half of the mandible uh and the sorry mandibular ramus are vis visible from this point onward the dissection proceeds exactly as described for the retromandibular approach the bony axis is the same in both approaches the vertical incision is made uh through the superficial musculo uh, epineurotic system onto the parotid gland extending uh, from just below the ear lobe uh, towards the gonial angle bluntly dissect parotid gland uh, from the underlying mesenteric muscle the dissection should be interior to the retromandibular vein branches of the facial nerve may be exposed during the dissection they should be identified and protected once the mandible's posterior border has been reached an incision is made through the pterygomesetric sling the peri a periosteal elevator is used to strip the mesenteric muscle uh, from the ramus further dissection superiorly along the posterior border exposes the condylar process uh, the illustration shows the amount of exposure obtained using this approach this is the clinical picture uh, showing the amount of the exposure one uh can obtained using this approach here is another view showing the posterior uh, mandible exposed through the retrodectomy approach a condylar neck fracture is being approached in this clinical photograph the retractors are used to retract the mesenteric parotid and the superior branches of the facial nerve 
deep closure is performed is described uh, for the retro mandibular approach. Uh, for wound closure, the pterygo mesetric sling is re-approximated with sutures. The wound is re-approximated in layers for anatomic realignment and closure of the dead space. The superficial musculoepineuratic system is resuspended. Any violation of the parotid gland capsule must be closed tightly to prevent a shallow seal or a salivary fistula. This illustration showing subcutaneous drain placement and closure, a small drain placed uh, into the subcutaneous space may be necessary to prevent hematoma. The drain can exit the posterior portion of the incision or through a separate stab in the posterior part of the neck. The skin and uh, subcutaneous tissues are then closed according to the surgeon's preference. A two-layer skin closure is usually performed. Thank you. Uh, now have a look into the summary of this presentation.